There's a famous story about the first person to wear a top hat and how his hat caused a riot. It took place in London in the year 1797. It's quite an interesting story and it was published in newspapers throughout the centuries. The events that transpired were reported as follows. John Hetherington, a haberdasher on the Strand, had designed a new hat for himself which was tall and made of silk. He brought his plans for the hat to Winkle & Co, a hat maker located on Fleet Street. John commissioned them to build the hat, which would cost him two pounds. On January 15, 1797, he wore it out for the first time, but only moments later he would be arrested. Later that day he was arraigned before the Lord Mayor, on charges of breach of the peace and inciting a riot. What had gone wrong, all he did was wear his new hat. Apparently the sight of the hat was so unusual that the people on the street stopped what they were doing to look at it. As John walked down the street, those people, filled with intrigue, now followed him and he had not made it far before being stopped by the crowd that had gathered around him. Then he was arrested and his hat was taken as evidence. The police report stated the following. Mr. Hetherington appeared on the public highway wearing upon his head what he called a silk hat. Having a shiny luster and calculated to frighten timid people, as a matter of fact, Officers of the Crown stated that several women fainted at the unusual sight, while children screamed, dogs yelped, and a younger son of Cordwainer Thomas, who was returning from the chandler's shop, was thrown down by the crowd which had collected and had his right arm broken. For these reasons, the defendant was seized by the guards and taken before the Lord Mayor. In extenuation of his crime, the defendant claimed that he had not violated any law of the kingdom, but was merely exercising a right to appear in a headdress of his own design, a right not denied to any Englishman. Hetherington was required to pay a bond of £500 before being released, which is equivalent to nearly £6,000 in today's money. The next day, John had made front page news, the January 16, 1797 edition of The Times commented on the situation, saying the following. In these days of enlightenment, it must be considered as an advance in dress reform, and one which is bound, sooner or later, to stamp its character upon the entire community. The new hat is destined to work a revolution in headgear, and we think the officers of the Crown erred in placing the defendant under arrest. Wasn't that an interesting story, but did it actually happen? It must have, right, given all the accounts and newspaper articles? Well, I tried to track down that quote from the Times, so I read through the archived edition of the 16th of January 1797. But the quote from this story is nowhere to be found. For good measure, I also searched the issues from the surrounding dates, as well as other newspapers from different publishers around that time. But I couldn't find any mention of the event anywhere. The first record of the story that I could find comes from a hundred years later. And from there on out, the story gets periodically republished over the following decades in a variety of newspapers from the UK to Canada and Australia. The earliest iteration of the story is often attributed to the January 1897 edition of the Hatter's Gazette. Here is allegedly explained that one of their correspondents had come into the possession of a newspaper clipping from an unnamed journal published in 1797. I say allegedly here, because while a number of later reprints of the story cited as such, I have not been able to track down a copy of this edition of the Hatter's Gazette to verify that this was the first instance of the story. What I have been able to find is that the story starts appearing in newspapers around the 15th of January 1897, 
The Hatter's Gazette was a monthly magazine, so in order to find out if the first print of the story appeared in this magazine, we'd have to know on which day of the month it came out. And that's information I haven't been able to find. But I have reasons to believe that the Hatter's Gazette wasn't the first to publish this story. The articles citing the Hatter's Gazette as the source all appear to be reprints from years later. If we take a look at the newspaper articles that came out on January 15, 1897, we see something different. The story itself is more or less the same as how I told it at the beginning of the video, but a different source is cited. How Mr. Hetherington fared, however, is best told by the journals of that date, whose pages have been searched for information by the Taylor and Cutter's special commissioner. The Taylor and Cutter was a weekly magazine, and in their January 14th edition, we find the earliest verifiable instance of this story. I believe that, like many other papers, the Hatter's Gazette reprinted the story that month, and papers retelling the story years later got things mixed up and attributed the Hatter's Gazette with being the first. Remember how, allegedly, one of their correspondents came into the possession of an unnamed 1797 journal. It seems like instead, it was the Taylor and Cutter's special commissioner who uncovered this story. And when we read their original article, we find out the identity of the previously unnamed journal. How Mr. Heverington fared, however, is best told by St. James's Gazette on January 16th. When we try to take a look at the St. James's Gazette from January 16, 1797, we run into a problem, however. The St. James's Gazette was only published from 1880 to 1905, so it didn't even exist in 1797. Still, this could have just been a mistake by the author of the article, as he might have meant the St. James's Chronicle. This isn't much help either though, as the earliest archived edition of this paper is from January 1st, 1801. On the front page of this one, we can see it was the 6715th issue. So, by using that number, and working the days backwards, also keeping in mind that they didn't publish a paper every day of the year, we can at least tell that this paper was around in 1797. We just don't have a copy of it anymore to confirm this was where the tailor and cutter got the story from. So, this article gave us two contemporary sources. The St. James's Chronicle, which is lost to time, and The Times, which I have been able to track down, but has no mention of the event. Keeping in mind that I also searched the other contemporary papers for it, is it just a coincidence that the articles this story is based off have since been lost to time? Or could it be that they never existed in the first place? You might think, what benefit is there in making up a story like this? Apart from just wanting to write a fun and interesting story, it actually could have had a deeper intention behind it. I do quickly have to mention here that this story, possibly having been fabricated, is just speculation on my part. Apart from the lack of evidence corroborating the story, I do not have any concrete evidence to prove that this story was fabricated by the tailor and cutter. With that out of the way, what benefit would there be in faking the story? A Canadian article from a few months later might lead us to an answer. The centenary of the stovepipe hat was celebrated in Paris on January 15. Many sartorial antiquarians scoff at the possibility of fixing so precisely the birthday of a fashion, but those who decided upon this date chose it because in London on January 15, 1797, the advent of that form of headgear was celebrated by public demonstration that nearly amounted to a riot and was duly chronicled in the papers of the next day. When looking at it retroactively, 
It seems obvious that this date was chosen because of the John Hetherington story. But it is odd that the first written records of the story only appear after this date was already decided upon, as can be seen in this French article from October 1896. England is preparing to celebrate the centenary of top hats. This is what emerges, at least, from a note published in the serious journal des Départs, the perfidious Albion. Not content with having taken Egypt from us, wants to gain the glory of having invented the i form hat. What particularly complicates the discussion is that this hat appears in turn in France and in England, without us being able to discover the exact moment when it came into the world. England could introduce into trial the portrait of its former kings, France, the fashion journals of the time of our distant ancestors. Here it says the English are the ones that will be celebrating, but the French do not necessarily agree with the date, nor do some of the antiquarians as the Toronto article suggests. But it's not just the English who are celebrating this day. When we take another look at the tailor and cutter, at the start it refers to them already having talked about top hats in their previous issue. So looking at the January 7th edition, we find an article talking about the centenary celebrations as well. The centennial anniversary, so we are told, comes around in January, and the Amalgamated Association of Headgear Producers of America will celebrate the occasion by banquet to which the leading members of the craft are to be invited. Here it says the American hat makers are organizing a banquet. No location is given, so we don't know if this is referring to the same celebrations in Paris. Either way, this indicates that both the British and the Americans knew the date. So this must mean the story was known beforehand, right? It's another chicken or the egg case. Did they choose the date because of this story, or was the story created to fit around the date that was chosen for the celebrations? In the French text, it's claimed that the top hat was invented first in France and then in England, but the French could not pinpoint it to a specific date or year. The lack of clarity suggests that it appeared both in France and England around the same time. So by faking a story like this, English hatters could take the credit. I did make one more discovery. It seems that it wasn't just the tailor and cutter that was looking into who invented the first top hat, as I found one earlier mention of John Hetherington. At least part of the story can be traced back further than the tailor and cutter's 14th of January article and they actually mention it in their 7th of January edition. The question may be asked, who invented the modern hat? Well, here is the story as it is told. The first high hat, it is said, was worn by John Heverington, a haberdasher, who was in the business on the Strand in London. He conceived the idea that a tall silk hat would prove a most becoming addition to a gentleman's attire, and Acting upon the fort, called upon Winkle & Co. of Fleet Street, who, at that time, were purveyors to the royal family, and from the plans which Heverington laid down, the firm built a hat at a cost of £2. It is to be remembered, however, that the beaver hat preceded the silk hat, and the modern top hat is only the successor of the hat with a sloping body, commonly worn in the 17th century. Note that here there is no mention yet of the fanciful events that followed. Those appear for the first time in their article from a week later. And while those additions to the event are credited to the research of the Taylor and Cutter Special Commissioner, the account published by them on the 7th of January does not originate with them. The earliest print of this version I could find dates from the 29th of December 1896, in the Westminster Gazette. Both the Westminster Gazette and the Tailor and Cutter refer to the article having come from the Warehouseman and Draper, which was yet another weekly trade journal. We know this journal existed, but there's no archived copy of it from around this time, 
As the first reprint of the article appeared in the newspapers of the 29th, we can assume that the Warehouseman and Draper probably published it sometime in December. This was still after the centenary celebrations in Paris were already announced, so the possible motives of faking the story could apply to the Warehouseman and Draper as well. But I have to admit that this account feels more credible to me than the one later written by the tailor and cutter. In the reprints of the Warehouseman and Draper article, we see the phrase, here is the story as it is told. And the question is, was this sentence added by the reprinters with the meaning of, here is the story as it is told by the Warehouseman and Draper? Or because this phrase is used in multiple reprints from a variety of newspapers, could it be that it actually formed part of the original article? In which case it could have the meaning of, this is the story as it is told colloquially. Meaning that it might just be based on an urban legend, which people had passed down verbally over the century, but was not written down anywhere. We don't know if the Warehouseman and Draper used any actual sources, but if they did, the subsequent reprints did not include them. So the story most likely isn't real, but it could still be based on real events, or it could also be entirely fabricated. Did the tailor and cutter just build upon an existing story to make it more sensational, or did multiple parties play a role in its fabrication in order to attribute the credit of having created the first top hat to England? With them also holding the centenary celebration specifically in Paris to rub it in the face of the French. There is one issue that I've kind of avoided talking about in this video, and that is that even if the story had been true, it wouldn't have even been the first top hat to have ever been made. The French article from earlier refers to depictions of top hats in old French fashion journals. And when I had a look for those, the oldest I could find was from 1796, a year before the John Hetherington story. And even before that, the first patent for what we would now call a top hat was filed in 1793 by another Englishman, George Dunnage. But this was most likely not the first top hat to have ever been made either. He was just the first to patent it. This information was also already known by the time the paper started printing this story, as in the article attributed to the Daily Mail, they had a reporter ask hat makers about it, for whom it was common knowledge that top hats had been around much earlier. The trade apparently concerned itself not at all with the centenary at Lincoln's and Bennett's. Yesterday, where a reporter made inquiry, the manager said that no attempt would be made, so far as he knew, to celebrate Hetherington's daring deed of January 15th, 1797. He also went so far as to assert that tall hats had been worn some years before that date, and referred in a hazy kind of way to old prints. The manager pointed to a pile of press cuttings on his desk as evidence of the fact that the idea of a tall hat centenary was somewhat widespread. However, at Scott's they were equally ignorant. But it is amusing to note that there also the idea prevailed that the tall hat was more than a hundred years old. Old prints were again referred to, but all attempts to pin the manager to some specific date for any such work of art bearing upon the question proved futile. So we are unable to pinpoint the first top hat to any specific date. We just know it came about in the late 1700s, either in the UK or France. And it wasn't an entirely new invention either. While the use of silk was novel, the shape of the hat had been evolving for some centuries. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to the channel.
I'd like to thank the people that helped me voice the quotes. Their details will be in the description and in the pinned comment. I'd also like to thank my patrons and channel members for their support, especially my $25 patron, G. David.